6,787 new COVID-19 infections have been recorded in South Africa. The National Institute for Communicable Diseases has also reported 199 new COVID-19 related deaths, bringing the total fatalities to over 75,000. Now, most of the infections are still being reported in the Western Cape with 1,967 new confirmed cases. KwaZulu-Natal reported 1,000 442 new cases, followed by Gauteng with 1,039. The health ministry says 16,104 vaccinations were administered in the latest reporting period, taking the total to 8,621,000 shots. Nearly 3.6 million adults, or 9% of the adult population, are now fully vaccinated, having received either their second dose of the Pfizer vaccine or one jab of the single-dose J&J vaccine. All right, we're now joined via Zoom by Dr. Daniel Israel from the Gauteng General Practitioners Collaboration to speak to us about the social impact of vaccines in societies and what one needs to know on how vaccines work. Dr. Israel, welcome to you on the program. Perhaps let me start off here, just following from that report that I've just read. How satisfied are you just by the number of people that have been vaccinated so far in South Africa? So it was a bit, thanks for having me on that. It was a bit of a slow start at the beginning, but we've seen a lot of momentum gained in terms of the rollout program, certainly in terms of what is on offer and the fact that young, younger people from age 18, as we know, will be offered the vaccine next month. I mean, the part that I would say is quite disappointing is that we're still seeing a, quite a big vaccine hesitancy amongst the general public in some sectors in South Africa and that is something that we definitely need to work on. In fact that was going to be another point I was going to raise to you. Um, we are still faced with many people not quite sure what the vaccination is all about. What's been your observations? What have uh, been you know the general feedback from patients about um, the vaccine process? Are people fully informed about it? I mean what what is the cause of the hesitancy? So I think that there's only a very small sector in South Africa that are, who are hesitant to do vaccines or won't do vaccines because they're anti-vaxxers. The majority of the people who have vaccine hesitancy, it's born out of ignorance and fear, which we can turn around and say, well, you know, is, as you're asking me, is there enough education? But in fairness, there has been a lot of education from the NRCD, from the Departments of Health and from, you know, practitioners across the country. Not only that, but I mean, we're even seeing initiatives between the private and public, and public sector and companies and with, the, with, with the health sector. Like, for example, uh, you may have heard of like the Wimpy, uh, you know, promoting uh, uh, coffees or whatever it is to incentivize people to vac vaccinate. So I don't think that the problem here is a problem of education. I think that the real problem here is just an innate fear of if someone feels healthy and well, why go and put something foreign into their bodies? But the, the, what really needs to be emphasized here is that the risk of getting COVID and its complications are, is much higher than any risk that this vaccine could pose. And that is what needs to be drummed to our public again and again. There are really little to no risks of vaccination. All right. Now, let's talk about just a different uh, misinformation, if it were, around just the various vaccinations that you that you get against the, the various variants. I mean, previously, there were concerns of, for instance, the efficacy of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine on the Delta variant. What's the latest on this? Can the Johnson & Johnson vaccine protect you against the Delta variant? So, Renati, we had excellent news that came out from the South African Medical Research Council on Friday last week through the, in the, the results of the Sisonke trial. And we must remember that this trial is quite unique in terms of its place in the world because it's a real live trial on real people, the healthcare workers in South Africa. And what was wonderful is that the original endpoints were not necessarily the endpoints we're measuring now. In fact, when, the, when we started vaccinating healthcare workers with Johnson & Johnson, as you know, there was no Delta variant. But now, months later, there is a Delta variant, and we were able to see how effective that Johnson & Johnson was against, well, at protecting people against the Delta variant. And the great news is that the, that the efficacy of the J&J vaccine against the Delta variant was excellent. Um, there was an uh, over 95% protection against death, 
And in terms of hospitalization, again, a high 87%. So the point is that really we've seen that at a single dose of Johnson & Johnson, a person is, may still get COVID, but they certainly aren't going to be landing up in hospital or uh, with mortality from it. Now, talking about those that actually believe in vaccination, they understand that you actually need to, to get va vaccinated in order to protect yourself and those around you. Uh, what happens to those that do get the first shot of the Pfizer vaccine, as an example, but then decide not to go when they are due for their second shot? I mean, uh, what happens in, in that case? Because some people, again, that hesitancy, that misinformation uh, seems to be some of the problems here where people say, uh oh, you know, um, there have been incidences and cases that if you go for the second time, you may get very sick and, you know, it might lead to death, etc. So I think that the important, the most important point here is that there is no evidence whatsoever that a second vaccine will lead to somebody getting sick or death. But what you're making reference to is the fact that often once the immune system's had its first prime, which is the first dose, and then 42 days later has a second dose, a person is could get side effects, which means just a very short period of a day or two of feeling a little bit flurry, a little bit, you know, maybe achy and a bit of a headache. Now, it is true that on a population-wide, um, you know, rollout of this vaccine, people may be hesitant to, 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 to go through that. But it's important to stress that it's well worth it. To answer your point about if you've abandoned ship after the first vaccine, um, it would only give you a partial protection. So we know that even on two doses of, John's, of Pfizer, there may be a waning of immunity afterwards. Certainly after one dose, you only have a partial immunity and you are more likely to still be able to, to still get complications. Uh, Dr. Israel, I'd like you to just clarify this one um, for us. I mean, I think it's, it's very important. We, we're seeing a lot of people talking about this. Um, you know, that when people uh, are vaccinated and um, then, you know, die following the vaccination, talk to us about why scientists are still stressing that there is no evidence that that was related to the vaccination. Why it's important for people to understand that it is, um, you can still get the, the COVID-19, um, you know, pandemic once you're vaccinated, but the chances of you dying are very, very, uh, you know, little uh, and few. See, I think when there's weariness about doing a vaccine and there will inevitably be cases where somebody gets a vaccine and because of their general states of health, they become unwell maybe from COVID and then they happen to get a complication, not directly of COVID, but just in general, you will have a certain percentage of people who who will die. And, um, you know, we see every year people with influenza who die or people who, 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 who sustain an injury and they have underlying cardiac disease and diabetes and they get complications and then they die. So what, the reason why scientists are so bent on trying to show that there's no causality from the vaccine is to allay the fears that the vaccine itself was the cause of death. And that's why it's really important to understand that there really has not been any incidences of death or serious illness or malady or disease caused from the vaccine itself. And if anything, there has been great proof that the vaccines prevent COVID-related direct illness and death. And, and it's important to keep strumming that point because, I mean, even today I had someone in my practice asking me, Am I really confident that the vaccine isn't a problem? I, I absolutely am, as are most doctors in South Africa. But perhaps also where the, the confusion lie is that COVID-19 vaccines may take a little bit longer to work, we are told, because of, uh, of people who are immunocompromised, example, people who have HIV as an example. So we know that H there are studies that have linked to HIV and contracting COVID as being problematic. In other words, HIV is a comorbidity that would be problematic if you got COVID. Mm. But we certainly know that with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and with the Pfizer vaccine, there has been no complications of HIV patients taking taking those vaccines. Um, and as you rightly say, I mean, if, the, if the immune system is impaired, all the more reason why they need a vaccine. And it does take time to build up those antibodies and that immunity, but they should jump onto the bandwagon as soon as they can so that if there are future upsurges and waves, which we're still seeing, unfortunately, that they adequately protect them. 
Uh, interestingly, I was reading an article about uh, a, a celebrity um, in the States who has decided that she is going to distance herself from all her friends and family who decide not to vaccinate. Let's talk about the social impact of what the vaccination hesitancy is doing in families and social circles, um, circles um, as an example. So I personally feel that the greatest challenge of COVID-19 is really understanding that we're part of a much bigger system and we have a much bigger responsibility to people beyond ourselves. Because the average South African is not someone with comorbidity or increased age, and they are probably going to survive COVID if they get it without complications in hospital. Remember, there's less than 10% um, pneumonia and complications of, of COVID. However, the problem is that there's a great social responsibility in stopping oneself from passing COVID on. Now, you may ask me, well, if you get the vaccine, you can still get COVID, so how does that help? But we do know that there's at least 50% less chance of getting COVID as a whole if you if in, in vaccinated people and passing it on. And we also know that vaccinated people, are, as I've just said, are less likely to become ill. So, you know, by, by refusing to vaccinate and becoming much more of a conduit for spreading it, you're actually doing a disservice to all the people around you. So I recently have said that it's a duty to vaccinate more than a right. One should be focusing on what one's putting out, not on one's rights, whether or not to have it. And in fact, it's also important for people to realize that once you're vaccinated, you can still get COVID-19, you can still spread it. So are we starting to see people saying, you know, I don't need to wear protective um, masks, um, as an example. I'm vaccinated, therefore I'm safe. Talk to us about some of those myths, you know, around once you are vaccinated, um, you know, you are immune to uh, even a new variant, as an example. So, so this is a very important point because I think that in the long run, our goal, and I thought, I'm sure that all of our, our, the viewers here would agree, is to be able to live life without masks and without PPE all the time. But one has to develop a certain amount of population immunity or herd immunity to stop the virus from spreading at a, you know, without the need for PPE. So we see in America, for example, at the moment, with the uptake in Delta, there's now been a reintroduction of masks and, and, and protective barriers. The point is that, again, this is about viewing oneself in the in context of the whole. If you do a vaccine and the people around you do a vaccine and the whole greater you know, population of South Africa do a vaccine, then the path of COVID amongst the population will be much, much less. And hopefully one day we will get, not one day, soon we will get to a point where we don't have to wear masks and PPE. But if we don't do it, and it's just pockets of people who are doing the vaccine, then unfortunately we still have to use PPE, and that's where we are at the moment. One still has to use PPE because we don't have enough of a population immunity yet. And I mean, we were told um, some couple of weeks ago that uh, we could be faced in South Africa with another wave of, of the uh, you know, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the fourth wave mm -hmm. in around about October. That was then moved to December. Where are we now with that? So if you look back historically, Nati, you'll see that there's about a five month, there has been about a five month gap between um, peaks in South Africa. Um, and that can be extrapolated depending on which province you are in and where you are in the country to possibly have other what happens in October to December. If you are, there will be other ways. I mean, I certainly think there will be uptakes because we're still sitting at a low percentage of the population having been vaccinated. But the biggest hope that we have not to have future surges is to vaccinate the population. Um, treatment has its limitations. Social distancing and mask wearing is great, but obviously at a point it's not taken up. So vaccination is our biggest chance of not having another wave. At the moment, we probably are heading for another wave. And that is unfortunate. Uh, Dr. Israel, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Really do appreciate you. Dr. Daniel me. Israel uh, from the Gauteng General Practitioners um, speaking to us there about all things COVID-19 related.